look real good yeah yeah I'm so proud of y'all welcome welcome to Reach City Church it is such a blessing to be here with you all today it is my favorite day of the week y'all I love gathering with the Lord's people and as today as we get ready to observe his resurrection as we always do right it's always a time to be grateful for the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ but we are gathered together because he got up amen and I am so grateful for that. This is Reach. Our vision is the holistic transformation of people and communities. This is my son. He's going to tell you our core values. Our core values is transformation, multiplication, and belonging and giving. Yeah. Yeah. Woo, Raise him up. That's my little disciple, y'all. Raise him up, my disciples. Amen. Yes, amen. At first he said forgiving. I was like, well, that's accurate too. Amen. Um, so I'm going to let him pray and we're going to have a good time of worship, praise, celebration. And I just love y'all. I hope y'all enjoy service. Welcome to all of our visitors. Amen. Thank you, God, um, for resurrecting yourself and dying on the cross for us so that we can have forgiveness and just so that we can be with God so that we don't have to suffer death and so we, that so you said the way the truth and the life no one believed no one comes to the father except for me and we just praise God today it is ready 
Resurrection Sunday, where he resurrected himself from the grave. And he forgave us dying on the cross. And and um, God saved each of our lives so that we can just be with him. worship God with us this morning. I don't know about y'all, but this is the monumental day in the life of a believer. This is the day that our Lord and Savior was resurrected with all power in his hand. He was the only one who could, who could uh, die on the cross for our sins, the only one that could atone for our sins, the only one that could make sure that death was not the end for us. That is why we worship him. That is why we praise him, because he is the only God here today so i don't care what situation you're in or where you are today is the day to give god praise because he's worthy of it because he's worthy of it because he's worthy of it and it's today is a day of celebration today is a celebration god we thank you and we love you and we adore you for getting up lord for resurrecting god for having the victory over death so that we could share in that victory that is enough Worship to our prayers. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the one and the only one that deserves it. Oh God, we thank you for getting up. We thank you for getting up so that we can get up with you, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, if you know this song, you can sing it with us. If not, the words are going to be on the screen with you. Come on, let's just have a good time. Hey. Every man falls down. Everyone needs grace. Your love is enough now. By your name we're saved. You look beyond our wrongs. And you saw just what we need. Because we are alive now. By your name we're free You got up so I could get up again Now I'm up again with you You got up so I could get up again You got up so I could get up again Sing I'm up with you I'm up with you, yeah. Come on if you believe it, say I'm up with you, yeah. I'm up with you Oh, oh, oh I'll Take it from the top Said every man falls down, say every man falls down, and everyone needs grace. Everyone needs Sing grace. your love is enough now. Your love is enough now. By your name we're saved. Your name we're saved. You look beyond our wrong. And so just what we need. Cause we are alive now. We are alive. Sing by your name we're free. Sing we are alive now. We are alive. By your name we're free. So you got up, say I got up so I can get up. We thank you, Lord. So you got up, say you got up so I can get up again. Now I'm up again. Sing up again, up again with you. You got up so I can get up again. Come on and say you got up, you got up so I can get up again. Oh Lord, we thank you. Come on, say you got up, you got up. So I can get up again. Oh God, we thank you. Sing you got up. You got up. So I can get, get up. Again. Say, sing, I'm up with you. I'm up with you. Come on, if you believe it, and lift your voice and say, I'm up with you. Oh, oh, oh. Hey. oh God, we thank you. Sing, I'm up with you. I'm up with you. Oh. I'm risen with my Savior. Say, I'm up with you. I'm up with you.
up, said I'm up with you, I'm up with you, I'm up with you. Come on, take it out. Sing, you got up, say. You got up, so I can get up again. Come on, if you believe it, say, you got up, Lord. You got up, so I can get up again. Everybody in this place, sing, you got up. You got up, so I can get up again. If you believe it, if you believe it, sing it with the say. You got up, so I can get up again. You got up, say, you got up, say. You got up, so I can get up again. Come on, if you believe it, rock with us. I sing it, you got a plot. So I can get up again. And I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful that you got up. So I can get up again. Sing, I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful that you got up. Sing, you got up again. Come on, sing it again. You got up, say. Your voice is saying, yeah. If you believe that he died and he rose for you, say, yeah. One more time, sing, you got up, say, you got up, so I can get up again. Last time, let's sing it together. You got up, so I can get up again. Sing, you got up, so I can get up again. Sing with us, sing with us, let me hear you say. Hey, hey, sing, you got upset. Come on, I don't hear you, I don't hear you say, you got up. There it is, there it is, sing, you got up, Lord.
point is, I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. He will never fail. He will never fail. He will never fail. He's always been there. Always. But I told the Lord, I told the Lord that I would sing in spite of whether I was up here or down there didn't matter because he's the God who has never failed. My body might fail me. People might fail me. But my God has never, ever, ever failed from beginning to the end. He has never failed. He will never fail. His track record is perfect. Death couldn't hold him down. He didn't fail when he was on the cross. He didn't fail in the grave. He shed his blood for me. 
So I will lift up my voice and I will praise him because he will never fail. I don't know about you, but my story is when I was in the midst of darkness, I cried out to him and he rescued me. I cried out to him and he rescued me. He didn't turn his back on me. He didn't turn a deaf ear to me. He heard me. He came and he rescued me. So even if my voice is not perfect, if my life doesn't seem perfect, he's the God who hears, who sees, and who responds. He's the God who is alive. He is alive and well. There's never been a time that he has not heard me. There's never been a time that he has failed me. He's the only consistency in my life. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. My Savior, the one, the only one, who has never and will never fail. That's my story. That's my testimony. If it's yours, sing it with us. We'll say, I sought the Lord.
song says we're praising our Savior all the day long. Can you hear? Do you
came and you gave us hope. We thank you. We thank you for the word that is going to go forth today, God. We thank you even in advance for those that come to render their lives to you. Those that will dedicate their lives back to you, God. The unchurched, the dechurched. We want to thank you for what you're going to do in their lives. Today and every day, Lord, let today be a transforming day. We are praying and thanking you for the angels in heaven that will rejoice for the one soul that will come. And we are celebrating what our King has done for us, Father. We give you all glory, honor, and praise. Let our hearts be postured towards you to receive this message. Let our hearts be changed and love you forever, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Children can be released for a children's church. Listen, we come into place today, uh, as all around the world, people are celebrating to this day, as the day where we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. However, man, it's a good thing that we don't have to choose a single day to always remember what it is that Christ has done for us through his death, through his burial, and through his resurrection. One of the things that we constantly always we want to reiterate, right, two things, right? And we talk about it to some of our my discipleship group, and people ask, have heard me say it from up here, right? But we, we aren't just saved by the gospel, but we live from the gospel. Also, um, uh, we don't just reap the benefits of the resurrection, but we also live from the resurrection, meaning that our everyday life should be a reflection of the resurrection, right? In, the, in light of its implications, in light of what it means, our lives should be molded around that and should be changed according to it, right? And so around the world, that is what people are celebrating today. But I would pray and I would hope that none of us let a single day be the one day that we decide that we want to celebrate our Lord and Savior. We want to celebrate his resurrection. Here's why. Celebrations last for the moment that you're celebrating it, right? Right? And, and obviously, there's many different conversations around this day and what it really means. And I certainly got my opinions and things about it. But for 2024, we'll leave it alone. <laughs> 2025 loading. But for 2024, we'll leave it alone. But the reason that we have to get to this place where we don't just see the day as a day of celebration. It's because celebrations, they kind of end. Oops, I ain't never start this. Y'all in trouble. I ain't, they kind of come and go, right? So, for example, yesterday, my wife and I, we got to celebrate uh, our daughter's 15th, uh, uh, what was it, birthday. Yep. <laughs> 
Hey, listen, pray for me. I'm, I'm tired, y'all. Listen, it's been a very long week. But um, so we got to celebrate uh, our daughter's uh, 15th birthday. Um, and listen, it was a great time. It was a party. My son, Dominic, thought it was his birthday. Uh, he partied harder than anybody. Um, but it was a great time. It was a beautiful event. It was great. However, about 8.30, it was time for me to go home, right? And I said, hey, at 8.30, I'm going to go ahead and head out, right? And so for me, at 8.30, the celebration was over, right? I went home. I watched the movie. I went to sleep. Woke back up a little couple hours later, right? And, and the reason that I was able to turn off the celebration is because I was just at an event. However, celebrating the life of my daughter didn't start at 12 a.m. on the 30th, and it didn't end at 8.30 when I went home, right? I celebrate her life every single day as a father by the way in which I choose to live my life, the way that I choose to go to work to provide for her, the decisions and the choices, the decisions and the choices that I make um, in order to make sure that I can stay present in her life, right? Because Lord knows there be things that make me want to not stay holy sometimes, amen? But I have to make decisions in my life that are rooted around my family. And am I going to be here to provide for them? Am I going to be here to take care of them? So every day my life is molded by the celebration of her life. And not just her life, all of my kids' lives, my wife, and everything like that. And so when I think about a celebration, I think of a moment. But when I think about living from something, I think about a rhythm of life. I think about something that we just naturally do. And we have to, as followers of Christ, get to a place where we don't wait on days, on Sundays, on prayer scheduled times, and whatever else that we put in our life as good rhythms to be the thing that causes us to enter into that space with the Lord while we're inside of that timeline or that schedule. Get what I'm saying? But we got to be able to be people that are able to find out how every single day the choices and the lives that we live reflects the belief that we have. And so celebrate Christ's resurrection today, but I want us to live from the resurrection every day. Amen? Amen. And so today we're going to talk from this title called Changed by an Empty Grave, right? Because if Christ rose, then the implications of this resurrection is grave, right? It is the assurance uh, of the resurrection that Paul encountered on the Damascus Road that became the change agent of his life, right? And it was many reasons why, and I won't have time to talk about all of that today in this message, so let me just give it to you, but it was less about the resurrection of Christ and more about what the resurrection of Christ meant, right? Because Christ rose and he truly was the hope of Israel that he said. Right. Because Christ rose, he really was the descendant of David, the eternal king that was prophesied in Isaiah nine. He was the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 because he rose. All of these claims of Christ were true and were real. And so when Paul encounters him on the Damascus road, it assured him that everything that Christ has said about himself is true. And because it's true, the implications, therefore, was there was a change that took place in Paul's life. So it's significant. And since Christ rose, he is our Lord as well. And that should mean something and our lives should shift as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to uh, stand before your people today to share your word, God, to just uh, be in your presence. Be in your presence, be in the presence of your children, your sons, your daughters, Lord. And so as I decrease, which you increase in me as I share your word this morning. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, turn to Acts 26 with me. That's where we're going to be. And we'll be looking at the second self-testimony of Paul. So if you're familiar with the book of Acts, we learn about Paul's conversion three different times, right? We learn about his, converse, his conversion according to, we learn about his conversion according to, uh, am I tripping? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, we learn about his conversion uh, as Luke is retelling it in, in Acts chapter 9. Right. Then we learn from Paul about his conversion on two different occasions in Acts chapter 22 and then in Acts chapter 26. In Acts chapter 22 and in Acts chapter 26, um, we see his self 
testifying or his self-testimony about himself, right? He's on trial before the kings, and they're uh, essentially because he's, he's, you know, spreading Christ, and so they're coming to him, and they put him in jail, and then he's got to go on trial. And so while he's on trial, he begins to tell his own story, and the reason he tells his own story is because he wants to validate himself before these kings. I'm going to switch mics. Check, check. You can hear me? All right, uh, Will, when you get back there, just pull me out of the, pull this one out the monitors. All right, so now if you're not familiar with Paul, um, Paul uh, is a household name in Christianity, right? He's wrote 13 uh, of our New Testament letters, right? He is uh, a favorite, right? People love Paul, right? Um, and now if you're familiar with Paul, you also know that he wasn't always this household Christian name. Right. He was someone who was a persecutor of the church. He was someone who was an antagonist of Christ. Right. Paul himself about himself in Acts 26, 9, 11 says this concerning the message of church and Christ. He said, I thought to myself that I had to act in strong opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons after receiving authority from the chief priests, but I also cast my vote against them when they were being put to death. You may remember in Acts chapter 7, right, Paul was there when Stephen was stoned to death, right? Paul was present there um, for, that, for, that, for that killing, right? And then he says, and as I punished them often in the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, and since I was extremely enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. And so when we talk about Paul, he was not always team Jesus, right? He was not always team church, right? But something happened in his life, Right. Christ, the resurrected Lord, appeared to him on a journey to persecute the church. And that brought about a change in his life. And so when we read his testimony this morning, I just want to look at three simple changes that took place because of Paul encountering the resurrected Lord. And I want to encourage us to make sure that us who live from the resurrection, we may not have seen Christ the way that Paul seen Christ. However, if you believe that Christ rose from the grave, then you have this, then you should carry the same implications in your life that should produce the same changes that it produced in Paul's life. Now, these three things aren't exhaustive, so I don't want y'all to be like these. The only three changes that got to take place <coughs> is more than that, right? And I don't want nobody to look at that and be like, wait a minute, you forgot this. I'm just giving three. What is going on? I'm just giving three. Right today. And so um, when we look at Paul's life, we're going to see these three. All right. And so uh, the first thing that I want us to pay attention to when we look at the fact that Paul had a change in his life is firstly, I want you to remember this, that we already talked about in Acts 26 that Paul was a persecutor of the church. Now we're going to see that he's on trial. While he's on trial, he is on trial. And his argument is that he is now on trial for the same hope that he once persecuted. And so what that means is that firstly, there should be a change in our allegiance, right? There should be a change in our allegiance because in Christ, I mean, belief in Christ should produce a course correction. There should be a change in our allegiance because belief in Christ should produce a course correction. What do I mean by that? That means, listen, we are one way and then we encounter Christ and then we believe on Christ. And since we believe that he rose from the grave, then all of his implications apply to us, which means he is the Lord of our life. He is, the, he is lordship in our life, right? That means whatever I once was, there should be a change from whatever side I was on to be on his side. Why? Because he's Lord. Why? Because he's Christ. Why? Because he's Messiah. And that's what takes place in Paul's life. Because he's seeing the risen Lord, he changed sides. He was one way. He saw Jesus, and he turned And went to the other team. Acts 26, verse 1 through 5, he says, Now Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul extended his hand and proceeded to make his defense. And he says, Regarding all of the things of which I am accused by the Jews, King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all of the customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. He says, I'm excited before you personally. Am I keep going in now? Okay. All right. Okay. No, I know where I'm at. I'm just trying to focus because there's also a clicking that's happening behind my head too. 
All right, so, um, so, so he says, I'm excited to be in front of you because he says, listen, you guys got me on trial. But everybody that I've stood in front of, they don't know all of the customs of the Jews. They don't know everything. So they don't really understand what I'm about to say. But you, Agrippa, you are somebody that is wise. You know the custom of the Jews. You know the belief. So you're going to understand fully what I mean when I say the things that I say. So he says, I'm excited to be before you. And then he says this, so then. All Jews know my way of life since my youth. He says, from my youth, I was this way. This is important. He said, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and in Jerusalem since they have known about me for a long time. If they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. He says, listen, guys. I'm not just telling you that I was one way. Because, you know, I, I made a joke one Sunday, and I was like, you know, uh, people be forgetting that like, we can really check their life. And so they get saved, and they start adding stuff on their testimony to believe that they was really about something they really wasn't about, right? And so Paul is like, just so you know, I'm really about everything that I said I was about. You know how I was from my youth, right? Y'all can testify that, listen, I for show, for show was a Pharisee. And that, what that means is that is one of the most, that is a term that speaks to how devout he was, right? That is a term that speaks to the fact of how much he was trained in the law, right? Because the Pharisees were trained in the law. They were defenders of the law. This is why they didn't rock with Jesus because they thought he was violating the law. We'll tell you about that in a little bit, right? But Paul is saying, I know the law. I've studied the scriptures. He says, I was devout. And by the way, the same way that you all are persecuting me right now, my, 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 my background led me to do the exact same thing, believing the exact same thing that you believe about me right now. Check, check. All right, turn this one down. Oh, this one hot. <laughs> Oh, Lord, he trying, he trying. So, he says, but you guys know about my life. And he says, and I want to paint this clear picture so that when you see the change in me, not be questioned why this change has come about. I wasn't some loose Jew, loosely following the law, kind of rocking with Israel, kind of rocking with Jew, Jew, Judaism. He says, I was in this thing. I didn't, li I didn't like Christ. Right. And he's telling them all of this because he wants to set this thing up. There was this big change that took place, though. I was a Pharisee, but now I'm an apostle. Right. I was a persecutor, but now I'm somebody who delivers a message to now free people. Right. Two completely different assignments. Right. So Paul says this about himself as well in Acts 22, verse 3 and 4. He says, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicilia, right, but brought up in this city, okay, educated under Gamaliel, right, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you are today. I persecuted this way, and this way was just the, the terminology that Christians was called before they was Christian. They were just called the way, right, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But he said, I persecuted this way to the death. Binding and putting both men and women into prisons. Different testimony, same point. Paul's zealousness for the law caused him to persecute those who he believes were following the blasphemer, Jesus. Because you know that's what they thought Jesus was. He was just blasphemer, right? And so his zeal had him thinking that he was doing the will of the Father. Now here's the thing about wills, especially about Paul, right? You can do the will of a father, but it doesn't mean you're doing the will of the father, right? <laughs> you can do the will of a father, that you're doing the will of the father. And, a, and, and an allegiance change requires a change in whose will we'll be willing to execute. So when we talk about we change our allegiance, it also means I'm changing whose will I choose to operate under, whose will I choose to execute, right? Now, now you remember that Paul is persecuting the church. Now, remember what Jesus said in Acts, I mean, in John chapter 8 concerning the very religious rulers who were persecuting him. They were trying to what? They were trying to kill him. And so what does Jesus say about them in John 8, 37 and 38? He says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are seeking to kill me. Why? Because my word has no place in you. He says, I speak of the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you've heard from your fathers. 
right? And who is their father and whose deeds and, and, and what is his deeds marked by? Well, just jump down to verse uh, 44. He says, you are the father, you are of the father, your devil, right? You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus says there is a there is a will of, of their father. Right. And what is that will that the anybody who is persecuting the church, anybody who is persecuting Jesus is not operating under the will of God, the will of Satan. This is what Jesus said, not me. Right. So any persecution. Right. That is towards the body of Christ is the will of Satan, because the goal of any persecution is to do what? To eliminate the movement. God doesn't want the Christian movement to be eliminated. Who, is, who wants the Christian movement to be eliminated? Satan. This is why whether it's intentional or unintentional, anytime someone comes against the body of Christ, they are not doing the will of God. They are not looking out for the church. They are operating under the will of Satan. And here's the thing, guys. You don't have to know you're doing it to do it. With good intentions, you can be operating in the will of Satan. Remember Peter? Right? Remember, he, 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 he just confessed who Christ was. He was excited. But out of the good intentions of his heart, not wanting his friend and his Savior to have to die, he tries to rebuke Jesus from going to the cross. He had every good intention. He wasn't trying to stop the kingdom. He was just trying to, he didn't want his friend to die. Right, and now we can all understand that. I don't want you to die, Jesus. Don't do, don't do that, right? And you would think Jesus would be good looking because I appreciate you looking out for my life, man. Ain't nobody got my back like you. You ride it for sure. I know why Jesus is like this. I'm waking up, y'all. Here it comes. <laughs> but what does Jesus say to Peter? Instead, Matthew 16, 23, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's purposes, but man's. Unintentionally, he tried to prevent the kingdom of God from advancing, and he didn't know he was doing it. Didn't mean he was not guilty of doing Satan's will. And that is why we need to be careful in all these interviews, and be quiet sometimes. Or maybe these interviewers need to stop putting artists up and actually get preachers to come on there and talk about the faith. So they can't stop saying the wrong stuff unintentionally doing the will of Satan. Okay. I'm not talking about nobody particular. I'm just making a statement from my notes. But the point of all of that is just to show that Paul is saying, I was one way, but now I'm another way, right? And my hope is that each of us will understand that we too were once one thing, but now we're called to be something different. We're called to play for a different team. Prior to Christ, we didn't do the will of God, right? We did the will of self, which is ultimately the will of Satan, right? I, a lot of times we want all of these, like only God got multiple wills, right, depending on what, what you believe theologically, right? But we like to think there's like this long list of wills. Like we like to think like, no, God, I'm not I'm not really doing Satan's will. I just kind of wanted to do it. Right. Like, no, God, I'm doing your will and I'm just satisfying my flesh a little bit. And God is like, there's there's one or two ways this things go. You either doing my will or you doing Satan's will. So even if you're giving over to the gratifications of your flesh, you are doing the will of Satan. It's quite simple, right? There's only two wheels in this world. And we need to choose which side we're going to be on. But if we believe in the resurrection, if we say that we believe that Jesus rose from the grave, then that means we are saying that we identify that Christ is our Lord and our Savior, which means he is deserving of our allegiance. He is deserving of us to say it is no longer my will, no longer Satan's will, which is the same will, but it is your will, Father, that I choose to do. 
That means we no longer live to gratify the desires of our flesh. We no longer live to push the agendas of the world, which are just Satan's agenda. But we live to gratify the desires of the spirit and push the kingdom agenda. And this means to change sides, we must choose to die. Right? You'll never stop doing, (laughs) put it in a more positive way. You'll never do the will of Jesus unless you are willing to die. Right? Something's got to die to do his will. Right? And here's the thing about death in the spiritual sense. There's a lot of things about death that we don't like. But there's a couple things about death in the spiritual sense. Right? And this is like good, but it's not. We don't like it, but it's good, though, still. Right? Jesus says, unless a seed falls to the ground and it cannot what? Bear fruit. Right? So if we want to do the will of our father, something has to die. And unless we're willing for something to die, we cannot bear the fruit that we say we want to bear. Right? That, that, that's the thing about death. Right? There is no multiplication for it, Right? Jesus, we cannot be resurrected with Christ if he does not first what? Die. And then if he does not first what? Rise. Right? He is our first fruits from the grave. Right? He is the firstborn from the grave. And because of his death and resurrection, we can now follow in that death and resurrection. But it had to die. Jesus says in John 15, what? Right? Every good tree that produces fruit, I'll do what? Prune it. <laughs> when it's pruning, cutting away dead things. Right? He says, I, the tree that produces good fruit, I'm going to prune that tree. Right? Why? So that it can produce more fruit. Right? If we desire to do the will of God, we have to pre- pre- uh, posture ourselves, place to be willing to let some things die. Die to the flesh and his will. Die to ourselves. Die to the conformity of this world system. If Christ rose, he is Lord, and therefore we live for him, not for self. And so what that means practically for your will, it'll change from person to person because we all got different things that we got to die to, right? So it'll change, but, but we really got to begin to ask the Lord, hey, okay, listen, I believe you rose, so that means you Lord, so what you want me to kill? And me. <laughs> and you. And you. <laughs> and you. <laughs> and you. I don't want nobody going home like, Pastor told me to ask God who I could kill. <laughs> Just, and you came to mind. <laughs> In you, amen. We got to be willing to ask that question because you're Lord. And as Lord, you get to tell me what got to go. You get to tell me what's got to be molded. You get to tell me what's got to be pruned. And I keep saying I believe you rose, which means I believe you are Lord. Unless we, okay. So something else you should pick up from Paul's testimony is how long and how hard he went for the other team, and yet he still changed. And what that tells me is that no matter how deep into a life track that a person might be on, they can still change, right? See, sometimes we like to think, like, the people that change didn't really, like, have it, have it, have it, for real, for real, right? We like to hear people's testimonies, and we like to be like, well, yeah, but you don't really understand, like, I was really in it. Like, like, like a lot of people hear my testimony, right, and, and they'll be like, and I'll be like, you know, I got saved on February 26, 2010. And that was also the last day that I smoked marijuana, right? Cold turkey, stopped. Jesus, okay, God spoke, clear as day. You know, y'all know my testimony. I, if I, I won't get to the message if I go into it. But those who know, know, right? Clear as day, getting high, God spoke, clear as day. You said you was going to get this up if I got you out of jail. Dang it, facts, okay, cool. Reveal yourself to me. Allegiance got to change. All right, so I'm going to smoking. At least that was like the one thing I knew I was doing wrong at that moment because I was doing it when he spoke. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right, I think this is for sure what got to go. <laughs> so other things, the sanctifying journey, I had to let get rid of it. But that one, I put it down, never smoked again. And they'd be like, yeah, man, but you don't, you don't really understand. Like, man, I blow blow, though, man. I blow blow. And I kind of, and I always laugh, man, because we like to think that just because a person can drastically change from something, that they wasn't really in something. And it's like... I, I blow blow and I be like, okay, sure. Like, and I got witnesses that like it's like Paul's testimony, like it's witnesses in this room that for me. Like it was nothing to smoke an ounce for fun, right? 
a day? I was the plug. I had it, so it didn't matter. But, <laughs> like, that was just the regular thing to do. Wake up, call some people. Like, I was that plug. I was the greatest plug for people because I would sell it to you and be like, hey, you want to smoke something with me, though? Because I need a partner in this. I didn't like to be alone. <laughs> hey, man, bless the Lord. But the point, though, is I know this is years of my life from the age of 12, right? So I didn't cold turkey because I wasn't in it deep. I cold turkey that's what the power of God is doing in your life if you surrender and submit to it. Now, that doesn't mean you'll have the drastic change in every area of your life. Sanctification is still a process. But there's some stuff that God just be like, wow, I don't care how long, how devoted you've been to it, right? And what I want us to do is not to let the length of our devotion, right, or be a justification to not die or to have slow growth. Because sometimes we do that. Well, I've been doing this all my life, and you can all your life stop, right? You don't have, we don't have to do the 10-year journey because you was in it for 20 years, right? Don't. If it takes 10 years because that's the journey God has for you, fine. I don't think anything needs to take 10 years, but fine. I'll get that to you. The thing is, don't make it a justification to not be intentional to grow and to die, right? Paul was deep in it. And then just like that, he changed. Acts 9, 17 through 20. Right? Uh, this is his account in Acts 9. Look what he says. Look how he shifted. This is, look how quick he shifted. So Ananias departed from and entered the house, and after laying his hand on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, whom appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me to you that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like fish scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. And he got up and was baptized. Now, I want you, this is where I want you all to pay attention, right? He got up. Right now, let's just go back. He Im immediately something like fish scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight. He got up. Got baptized. This is why I always tell people I don't understand why we be waiting for like the three month new members class to get baptized. Like he got up, was baptized, <laughs> right, and took food and was strengthened. Right, he needed to eat. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were on in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, "What? He is the Son of God." He was on his way to go and kill Christians and drag them back to Jerusalem to put them in jail. He encounters the resurrected Jesus. The resurrected Jesus sends Ananias to him to, to bless him, help the scales fall from his eyes, baptize him, touch, lay hands on him so he receives the Holy Spirit. And Paul did not then wait to make an allegiance change. He, he went from going to persecute the Christians in the synagogues to going to the synagogues to say, hey, I was on my way to kill you, but hey, I was wrong. Guess what? Jesus is the son of God. New message, my fault. <laughs> Call the chief. <laughs> At least not with Christians. <laughs> it was immediately. Drastic change in his life. One message shifted to another message quickly. But I want us to notice two things, though. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he had a drastic change. Right? And change is possible if you believe in the resurrection. It comes with the Holy Spirit. And so it doesn't matter how blind a person is or how deeply in bondage a person is. The power of the spirit through submission to the spirit will bring about change. It doesn't matter how blind a person is or how deeply in bondage a person is. The power of the spirit through submission to the spirit will bring about change. This is why Paul's story is so popular. Because you can be that lost to the point where you're murdering God's children. And God can still encounter you and do drastic like that. We read Paul's story and it gives hope to all of you. If you're going to take the murderer of your people, you certainly going to accept me. And I ain't killed nobody. You know what I'm saying? Got to be able to get in here. We read Paul's story for encouragement because it shows us that it doesn't matter how lost we were. It doesn't matter how dark our past. Was Jesus can still reach you, and he can still change you, and he wants to. Right? He wants to. And so we got to stop thinking that that same power can't break through our chains and our blindfolds. 
or the chains and the blindfolds of other people when we look at them and don't and want to rid them off and forget that we're here to preach the gospel to them, that we're here to spread the love of Christ to. Instead, we, we look at them and just be like, sure, it's rap for them. They go to hell. I mean, well, if they died today, maybe, but don't just rid them off like that. <laughs> there is hope for them, right? And you are the light. You are the one that is supposed to go proclaim. Okay, I'm going to say something about that in a minute. But it does require, right? Change does require dependence on Christ over dependence on self because we can't do it on our own. But with Christ, we can. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the reason why change takes the work of the Spirit is because the chains and the blindfolds are supernatural. So we got to understand this. If, if the chains and the blindfolds are put on supernaturally, why do we think in our natural strength we can remove them? Man didn't put the blindfold on you. Man didn't put the chains on you. You or no other man can break them. You or no other man can remove them. Why am I saying that? 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. And if the gospel is veiled, some of y'all got some veils. No, okay. And if the gospel is veiled, anybody, let, me, let, me, let me get one of y'all props. <laughs> <laughs> if, the, <laughs> if the gospel veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world, who's the God of this world, just to be clear? All right, everybody see that little G right there? All right, that's not, that's not talking about Yahweh, right? In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Who blinded them? Not man. So this is a supernatural blinding. These are supernatural chains. So that means you need a supernatural power that is stronger than that power in order to take the blindfolds off and in order to do what? Free you from the chains. Because the enemy has placed a veil over our eyes of the unbelieving, preventing them to see the truth. Example, remember what Jesus says to the teachers of the law in John 5, 39 and 40? This is how powerful the veil is. He says, you examine the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is those very scriptures that testify about me. And yet you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. You guys study this stuff. Every day. Paul says in Acts 13, you study him in, the, in, the, in, the, in every Sabbath. You study him every single day. You study the word of God. You know all the Hebrew, all the Greek. You know all the background history and everything. And yet and still, the blindfold, the veil is so strong that you can study the scriptures every day. See me standing in front of you, Jesus, and still deny me. Miss that everything in the scriptures are pointing to me, but you're the teachers. But that's what the veil does. That's the power of the blindfold. It doesn't allow you to see even when you see. Even when he's standing in front of you, it does not allow you to see. And many of us are either in that state right now or been in that state. How many people reject Christ all day long? And the reason they reject him just don't even make any sense the evidence is right in front of their face. They read the same. I remember for, for okay, I remember for uh, eh, probably months, 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 yeah, at least four months and consistently um, meeting at, um, I forgot the little spot up there on Coventry. Every morning, every Wednesday, not every morning, but every Wednesday with a young fellow um, who just didn't believe in the resurrection, was by, wanted to lead the faith, and it was like, he has, I had so much, this is, I had so much pressure on me. It was like, you're the last hope, Tanks. Convince me or I'm gone. And it's like, well, you ain't going to probably be gone. But, um, because <laughs> I can't convince anybody for anything, right? But I met for like four months, every Wednesday, go get breakfast, talk through the evidences of the resurrection. And we're looking at the same evidence, reading the same stuff on the cross with two completely different conclusions. And for the life of me, I kept saying, I'm sitting there, I'll be praying, I'll be like, I don't understand how we missing this. It is like right here. I ain't even talking about from the Bible, I'm talking about extra biblical. It is right here. How are we missing? And it became clear as day, God said, he's blind. And it was like, I keep trying to present, prevent, present knowledge to somebody who can't see. And so instead of one wasting my Wednesday morning, 
How about I just start praying, God, let this brother see it. Because until he sees, there's nothing I can give him to help him. Okay, he did end up, you know, leaving the faith and everything, but I'm still praying that he'll see, right? But we can't come to the truth on our own. That's the power of the veil, right? And so Paul encountered the more powerful, and he was filled with the more powerful. And so each of us have the same thing. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, believing in his death, burial, and resurrection, we have the more powerful in us, the Holy Spirit who is constantly able to to free us from whatever chains, whatever bondage we may be in, who is constantly able to help us see, right? This is why sometimes as believers, I'm like, yo, we got to ask God for some sight. Because some of us, we might not have like a total blackout veil on our face, but we 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 ain't seeing clearly still, right? We looking at stuff in the world, and I'm like, we don't see this. We don't see this. This stuff ain't even in secret. I don't know if this is true or not. So I'm about to just make a statement and don't, because I don't know if it's true or not. I don't, but because somebody kept sending me, is it true that, that they changed the day to something? That's, that was true. Like that really happened from the White House. Right. Now, it's not a huge problem for me. Technically, it's more of a problem for y'all. Anyway, I leave it alone. But, <laughs> um, but, and yeah, okay, I shouldn't. Okay. So, but he changed the day. Right? Okay. This is in plain sight, y'all. Right? And if we can't look at this stuff and be like, yo, something is off, then we're missing it. But some people will see this and be like, no, this isn't really like an attack on, like, Christianity. It really, no. Take the blindfolds off of your eyes. Right? But change is possible. But it requires a supernatural not the natural. And Paul's belief in the resurrection produced this allegiance change. But it also didn't produce an allegiance change. Second thing it did, Christ's resurrection should change who, what, and where we place our hope. Christ's resurrection should change who, what, and where we place our hope. Paul says in Acts 26, 6 through 8, and now I'm standing, now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. For this hope, O King, I am being accused by the Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God raises the dead? Right? Israel has been reading and waiting for the fulfillment of the promise. Promises that had been given them hope. And Paul says that Christ is that hope and that he preaches this very hope promised to the fathers is Christ. The very hope that has been promised to the fathers is Christ. Look, look, look how Paul explains this in Acts 13, 32 and 37. He says, we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to those who are of the descendants by raising Jesus. And it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son. Today I have fathered you. As for the fact that he raised him from the dead, never again to return to decay. He has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and faithful mercies of David. Therefore, he also says uh, in another Psalm, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. For David, after he had served God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep and was buried among the fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Right? Now, that's a lot. But all Paul is saying is that Jesus fulfills the awaited promise of the divinity king. He fulfills the awaited promise of the divinity kingdom, the everlasting kingdom, come through the seed of David. He says, listen, this is Christ right here, fulfilling that hope, fulfilling that promise. Everything you all are waiting on and hoping for, the very thing that you are earnestly serving God day and night for, he says Christ is it. And instead of placing your hope in Christ, you reject Christ and keep placing your hope in the earnest serving of God, which look what he says about that, verse 37 and 39. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Right? What's the other promise? Well, 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 Israel's waiting on their redemption. They're waiting to be called back home. Right? They're waiting on the regathering. Really, it's this resurrection language language that also speaks of the remnant of Israel returning. Right? But it says they're waiting. But he says, listen, he has come, right, uh, 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 to you, brothers, that through forgiveness, through him, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, here it is, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be free through the law of Moses, the very thing that they serve God earnestly day and night for. He says, listen, you are placing your hope in this thing. 
that has no ability to free you from all of the things that you need to be freed from. And this word free really is just another way of saying to justify you from all of the things that you could not be justified from according to the law of Moses, right? And yet he is right here in front of them. And instead of transferring their hope to him, they are rejecting him and continuing in the course and the path in which they were on. <laughs> Here's the problem with that. Misplaced hope will always lead to vainless straining. Right? Misplaced hope will always lead to vainless straining. What do I mean by that? When your hope for whatever is in something other than Christ, you find yourself working tirelessly, effortlessly, vainly, right, to try to achieve it. Why? Because it's ineffective to satisfy. It's in vain because it can't satisfy you. This is another drink, right? This is when you're grieving and you turn to these unhealthy ways of grieving, you need another drink in order to grieve. Why? Because it had no way to actually deal with the pain that you were right? This is why you need another boo, right? Because like, they can't do it. And I promise you, she can't do it. Got to be a foundation in Christ that then allows her to complement what I need, right? But when but looking and placing your hope for whatever you're needing freedom from in anything other than Christ, it is just vain straining. Because you find yourself just overworking, trying to get something that can't work to actually work, right? But when we give it to Christ... When we place our hope in Christ, when we let the weight of whatever it is that we need him for be the thing, right? That is when our efforts stop being in vain, right? It's not a bad thing to serve God earnestly, y'all. He Paul is not saying, oh, my goodness, you're trying to serve God earnestly. No, I hope you guys desire to serve God earnestly. But what he's saying is you're trying to serve God earnestly by a method that can't free you, that can't justify you. Therefore, your service is of nothing. Instead, place your hope in Christ and then serve God earnestly because now your foundation is right. So now the work that you put in is not in vain, but it is of effect, right? Paul says, I once was placing my hope and trying to be a Pharisee of Pharisees, trying to be the most devout Jew. But I came to realize that that hope can't save me. And so when I encountered the risen Lord, I changed my hope. I changed what I put my hope in. But again, the veil is powerful because while they read the scriptures and know the scriptures, they still were persecuting Jesus and they're even persecuting Paul. And here's the thing about this veil. <laughs> the veil of the enemy is so powerful, it's powerful enough to keep people from seeing the very thing that they've been hoping for. They're waiting on the Messiah. They're waiting on the hope of Israel. But the veil is so powerful, they're rejecting the very thing that they have wanted, the very hope they've had. And I wonder how many of us have fallen victim to, to desiring something and then Christ being right in front of us, offering it to you, wanting to give it to you, rejected, unable to see that the very hope that you have been desiring is right in front of you. How many people have rejected just want to be free? Saying I need to be saved from these chains. Saying I just need a, a better life. I need something. And we present Christ to them. And instead of being like, that's, that's, that was it. That was the hope. We choose, or they choose, or some of us choose to still say, nah, I don't want Christ. But what changed in Paul's life was that he put his hope in Christ. He changed his hope. And many of us, if we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we too should be a people who have now changed the thing that we place our hope in. It can't be all. It can't be relationships. It can't be our job. It can't be anything other than Christ. That makes sense? But remember, I told you it's got to be supernatural, right? And it's interesting, right? Paul couldn't see this thing in black and white, and so he literally had to see it in light, like literally like in light, right? Acts 26, 12 through 15. While so enraged, I was on a journey to Damascus with the authority of the commission of the chief priest at midday, O king. 
I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who were journeying with me. And when I had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. goats. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So here Paul is on the road, veiled, on his way to commit persecution to Christians. And what does he say? He says he sees a light brighter than the sun shining in his presence. And who was the light? Well, it was none other than the very person he was on his way to persecute. It was the very person that he was denying had ever rose, right? He says this light shone on me. And, and now some people have made arguments that, that he didn't actually see like there, but I just think the text denies that, right? First and foremost, Paul just says, he, Jesus says, I'm, I'm, I'm appearing to you, right? Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, Paul says, for God who said light shall shine out of the darkness is the one who has shone, shone shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God where in the face of Christ right so so the light was there uh and, and Paul says that that God's glory has shown in the face of Christ and this and Paul is being surrounded by this great light right but secondly when he says that he appeared it, the Greek word literally means to become visible Right. Then you also got first Corinthians nine one where Paul is defending his apostleship. And he says, am I free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus? Our Lord, are, are you not my works? Are you not my works in the Lord? Then in first Corinthians 15, five, eight. Right. Paul says, and he appeared to Cephas, talking about Jesus after his resurrection, then to the twelve. And after he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom remain until now. But some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one ultimately born. He appeared to me also, right? If Paul didn't see Jesus, it's news to him, right? Paul completely believed that who he saw on the Damascus road was not just a revelation or some vision, but it was the literal, physical, resurrected Christ. And, Paul, and Jesus says to him, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And this is interesting because whenever you speak against the church, whenever you attack the church, you are doing that to Jesus. And this is something that I think we miss. That when church, whenever we come against the church, whenever we say negative things about the church, we are not just saying it about the church. We are saying it about Jesus. So, 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 so people got to tell Jesus that he's the church. Right, because that's, that was the saying, right? Christ ain't the church. Well, let Jesus know that. Because I don't think he picked that memo up. Because he said, you're persecuting me. But Paul ain't did nothing to Jesus. He did it to the church. But Jesus said, but you per you doing it to me. Why? Because it's my body. Right? So, so Christ is the church. <laughs> right? Because whatever you do to the church, you do to Christ. Again, this is why they got to stop letting musicians give theology on these radio shows and let teachers actually go and teach what the Bible says about stuff. Because the Bible just don't be agreeing with these podcasters. Okay, so, but notice what else Jesus says. He says, yo, it's hard to kiss, kick against the golds. And the gold is this large stick that's, that's pointed at the end and, and it's sticky. And so what they would do um, in order to get the, the cattle to kind of do what they want to do, right, they would kind of guide it and they would keep the, uh, the gold kind of behind it. So what would happen is if the animal kind of kicked against it, it hurt, right? So they would avoid doing it. And so, and check, okay, <laughs> this is annoying, we're going to fix this next week, I promise, uh, got time this week, so, um, and so what happened is, Jesus is coming to him, and he's saying, why are you fighting me, right, when he says, why are you kicking against the goals, he's saying, you're persecuting my church, trying to stop the movement, why are you, why are you fighting against my kingdom, why are you fighting against the advancement of the kingdom of God? You're just kicking. You're hurting yourself. And God, that when he says that the kingdom, that the gates of hell will not prevail, Jesus is so powerful that he don't got to shut down the gate. He just changed the gatekeeper. So, so Jesus went and he said, oh, this gate trying to keep us out? I'm just going to convert the gatekeeper. So now the gatekeeper on our side. And you know what happens? It's the same thing that happened when Paul was in prison and, and the gatekeeper witnessed what took place in Paul's life. He got converted and Paul could have went home. He didn't know, but he could have. In other words, the gatekeeper was more than willing to say, come on, man. 
And that's the same thing that happened. Jesus said, Jesus said, okay, there's a gate. I'm just going to convert Paul. And he's powerful. You know what? Nah, we could, we could get him up out of here, right? But instead, I'm going to use him, right? I got enough power that I'll just convert all the gatekeepers. Anybody that's powerful enough, I'll just be on my side, right? And, that's what, and so he said, Paul, you fighting against me. You just hurting yourself. And by the way, you got to do what you do anyway. Why is that, Jesus? Because I'm Jesus. <laughs> but not just because he's Jesus, but from Paul's perspective, the resurrection proved that he was who he said he was. And so Paul was more than willing because he was waiting on the hope. Paul really was waiting on the Messiah. He was confirmed that it was really him. He had no problem. Your will, not my will. Right? I want to think, well, I'll skip that. Let's go here. Right? Yeah, let's go here. So the third thing then that this should produce in us is thirdly, Christ's resurrection should produce a change in assignment. Acts 26, 16 through 18. But get up. This is Jesus. Get up and stand on your feet for this purpose I have appeared to you. Jesus said I appeared to you. To appoint you as a servant and a witness, not only of the things which you have seen, but also the things in which I will appear to you. Rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Christ says stand up. The light is shining all around him, and, and, and it causes Paul to, to drop to his knees. And, and, and all of a sudden, Christ speaks, and he says, stand up. And, 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 and if you're familiar with your Bible, this is a very familiar scene. It was a prophet commissioned by the Father in Ezekiel, right? And this scene is very similar. Look at Ezekiel 1, 28, verse 2, uh, 12, chapter 1, 28 through chapter 2, verse 4. He says, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on the rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice speaking. Then he said to me, son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, and the spirit entered me and, and, and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. Then he said to me, son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel, to a rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have revolted against me to this very day. Right? This is a very similar vision. And what is taking place in Ezekiel? He is being commissioned by the Father to go. And what is taking place with Paul? He is being commissioned by Christ to what? Go. So this was not just some casual visit to Paul to stop persecuting the church. This was a visit to commission Paul as an apostle and a missionary first to Israel and then to the nations. He, Paul is on his way to, to put people in prison and he says, rescue them. This is literally a assignment. It don't get that much more of a change. I'm on my way to put you in prison. Now I'm on my way to rescue you. I encountered Jesus. He gave me a new assignment. And the same thing is true for us. Right? Whatever we were on, whatever we were doing, whatever we thought our assignment was, <clears throat> in Christ, if you believe in the resurrection, he is Lord. And just in case we think that we aren't commissioned with Paul, let's remember the Great Commission. Right? Paul was commissioned, yes. And then Jesus said all authority is given to him. Right? Now, therefore, what? You go. Right? And make disciples of what? All the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all of my commandments. Right? You are on the commission. Whatever you thought your purpose was, here's a new purpose for you. Advance the kingdom of God. It's that simple. Now, your assignment may be different. But your purpose is the same. Every last one of us who are in here who name of Jesus has one purpose. We don't have to search for it. We ain't got to stop. We can stop reading all of the lying books that got y'all confused anyway. How many of y'all have ever found your purpose in those books? I just want you to just tell me. If that book really helped you with your purpose, let me know. Because people still ask me what my purpose is, and they read the books. The books is confusing. I don't even know if I should be preaching when I read the books. I'm like, I think, I think I'm supposed to. Start a business. Okay. So, <laughs> and some of you may. Some of y'all need to, actually. But, but if you believe that Christ rose from the dead and your assignment is to no longer live for the world or self, but to live for the advancement of the kingdom of God, that is your purpose. That is your new assignment, right? Stop promoting the world's agenda, which we so freely and enthusiastically did, and start promoting the kingdom of God.
right? Paul's whole life mission changed after encountering Christ, right? Now, hmm. those are my three points, but I'm trying to see if I'm going to give you this bonus. I'm going to give you this bonus right quick. All right, so uh, here's a quick apologetic bonus. I think it matters, actually. Uh, Paul's talking to a Jewish audience at time, right? We know that, right? And we're reading that, right? And the Jewish background of the Christian faith, right? Why do I have a problem? Because if Jesus is not the hope of Israel, he ain't your hope, right? If Jesus is not Israel's Messiah, he ain't your Messiah. Here it is. Unless Christ is the hope of Israel, he cannot be the hope of humanity, but he is the hope of humanity, right? Why is the hope of Israel? Now, here's the apologetic bonus. Notice that Jesus says to Paul, hey, I am sending you, right, to free you from the Jews and the Gentiles in which I am sending you. That, uh, put that, right? I'm going to rescue you from the Gentiles. Well, he's doing what? Sending him to who? The Jews. To do to the Jew, he's supposed to open up their eyes, turn from darkness, and from the power. He's pronouns. They receive and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Right now, I'm giving you this because y'all are black people, and y'all gonna run across some other black people, and these black people are gonna tell you that you black, but you ain't black. <laughs> you Israel. Right? And these black people may try to convince you that Jesus Christ is only the savior of black people, a.k.a. Israel, because y'all the true Israel. Okay. Y'all going to run across them. Right? Some of y'all have run across them. Some of y'all, and they sound good, guys. I just got to keep giving you these apologetic moments because they do sound good. Right? When I first started talking about them, I was looking like, so, Pastor. What 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 this mean? Cause they said, <laughs> he like sit down, boy. Let me teach you. <laughs> I'm like, well, teach me, cause boy, you're about to lose me. <laughs> cause the brother's sounding good, brother. I am Israel. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> I promise you, I was in season. I was like, oh Lord. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, I, but I always I want to bring this out because I want you guys to understand because we're gonna because they're gonna also tell you, listen. The word Gentile, uh, uh, of course, he had to send them to the Gentile nations because the, the, the Israel was scattered into the nations. And so they had to go preach to the nations. But the purpose of preaching to the nation was to wake up the Jews that were in the nations. Then others will tell you that, well, sometimes Gentile just means uh, uh, Israel in a, in a Gentile state of mind. In other words, they were just cultural Jews, right? So this is kind of what, they, what, they, what they'll kind of tell you, right? But I, I just want to let you see how that just don't work according to what Paul just said. Now, they don't like Paul. Paul destroys all of their arguments, so they just get they just do away with Paul. But we gonna stick with Paul because we like Paul, right? Uh, let's go Acts nine fifteen real quick. Uh, apologetic moment. Give me three minutes. We out of here. Acts nine fifteen. But the Lord said to him, "This is this is his uh uh, uh you know in in Acts nine his conversion." But the Lord said to him, "Right, go. He is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and what the sons of Israel." Right, now, anybody that reads the Bible, you understand, especially those who are in teaching, this is called a list, <laughs> okay? <laughs> this is not the same. This is a list. Literally, Kai, right? The end. Kai is letting you know this is something different. The Gentiles, Gentiles are not the sons of Israel, right? And so Paul seems to believe that he was called to the Gentiles and the Jews and the rulers and the kings, right? But just in case that don't get you, because they don't like that one either, let's go to Acts 13, 46 and 47, right? Now, this is, I, this, I love this one, because you got, it's a lot of explaining for this one, right? Paul said, right, they, been, they had no success preaching to the Jews in the synagogue. And so in verse 46, Paul and Barnabas spoke. Hold on, where am I at? Do, 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 do. Oh, okay. Uh, Paul, yeah, no, no, I was looking ahead or something. I know what it is. No, nah, man, I ain't even gonna lie. You know, I saw a word I couldn't pronounce coming up early. I had to look at it. I was silly. I was sounding out of my head. <laughs> I was like, repudiate, repudiate, repudiate. Yup. <laughs> my bad. I'm back now. All right, I got it. Repudiate. There we go. Got it. Woo. All right. 
Paul said, <laughs> Paul and Barnabas spoke. I ain't going to talk about me. And boldly he said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first since you repudiate it. Come on. And consider yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Oh, come on. What? I ain't gonna for the... <laughs> Give me some. Ooh, I, I took a whole pause. <laughs> I was looking ahead like, hold on, what's that? All right. I was like, this is a different translation. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and consider yourselves unworthy. Here it is of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Why? For so the Lord has commanded us. I have appointed you as a light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Notice that Paul says, hey, listen, we've been talking to the Jews. But listen, our mission was never just to the Jews because Paul remembers his commission. I'm sending you to the Gentiles, to the kings and to the sons of Israel. So guess what? I've been talking to the sons of Israel. They ain't listening. So guess what? We got another people group we were supposed to go talk to. So now we about to go to the Gentiles. Because, he quotes Isaiah 49 and 6, Christ, it is, a, it is a small thing, it is too small of a thing to think that he has come to be simply a light to, the, to Israel. No, I am sending him to be a light unto the nations, the salvation of the nations. Last one, icing on the cake, just in case they don't like that one. Let's go to Acts 22. This is all what Paul said. We ain't making this up, right? Look what Paul says in his final testimony. Well, not his final, but in this one, in my final verse for his testimony. This one is, this is my icing on the cake because you got to explain this one to me. Paul gets the same testimony. And he says this, and then the text says this. And he said to me, Paul, talking about Jesus, said to me, go for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Now, now listen to this. They, that's the Jews, listened to him up until this statement. And then they raised their voices and said, away with such a man from the earth, for he should not be allowed to even live. They listened to the entire testimony of Paul. And the moment he said, and he told me to go to the Gentiles. They stopped and said he don't deserve to live. Why would he do that? Because that is ridiculous to them. To that their savior is supposed to go to the nations and save the nations. Not the nations that put us in captivity. Not the nations that we hate. Not the nations we're supposed to be the head over. Not the nations that's supposed to be cursed for touching us. No way is our savior going to send you to go save them. They on their own. Right? They were irate. They were pissed. Why? Because you are lying. You are a blasphemer, not our Savior. If they really thought that the Gentiles were just their lost brothers, why would they have a problem with Paul going to preach to them? Because it wasn't their lost brothers. It was literally non-Israelites. Amen? Amen. Now, that was just your quick apologetic moment, just in case you run on to the guys in the street. But don't try to stand there with them all day. Call me. But the point of the message today was simply that when Paul encountered Christ, it revealed to him that Christ was everything that he said he was. And because he was everything that he said he was, he was Lord. And because he was Lord, he made some changes in his life. He changed his allegiance. He changed what team he played for. He changed where he placed his hope. Whatever he placed his hope in before, he no longer did. And he changed his assignment. Wherever he wanted to do, wherever he was going, it all now had to Not just the moment. We, too, have to be people who constantly live our life with a changed allegiance. Whatever side you was on, switch to the other side. Right? If you was rocking with the world, you got to leave the world. If you're still struggling with being in the world, you got to leave the world. Right? You got to say it don't matter how good you look, no matter how good it's going, I can't be with you because you ain't with Jesus. And I ain't just talking about the world. That's, that's, I'm using a noun. That's people. That's these relationships. Right? Because some of us are in split allegiances. We walk with God and date somebody who hate them. So... Anyway, so point being though, I said what I said. And I said it because I love you. Right? Right? So, Ephesians got us, no matter how good they is, mm, go anywhere. All right, so then, what's the second one? And then, whatever you've been hoping in, because we all got hopes. We all are hoping something. We all depend on something. Whatever it is, if you really believe that hope, 
that other stuff go. That's those of us who have obsessive drinking problems. That's those who got obsessive drug problems, who turn to a blood, who turn to alcohol, who turn to women when you're lonely or men when you're lonely. Those of us who are who are caught in, I mean, maybe you're in a depressive state and you turn to, to binge watch, I don't, you know, whatever the stuff is, right? That can't be your hope, right? You got to find Christ to be the foundation in that. And then whatever your assignment is, whatever you're doing, I don't know where you work, I don't know what you feel like God, your assignment is, but whatever it is, it's got to be transformed to be used for the advancement of the kingdom. Why? Because if Christ is Lord, that's what he told us to do. And what does servants do for their Lord? They obey him. It's really simple, right? And so I just wanted to, there's more changes that need to take place, but I just wanted to talk about those three today from the text. Um, and so as we... Um, let me just pray. Father, I thank you uh, for the opportunity to share your word this morning. Father, I thank you uh, um, just, just for your death, your burial, your resurrection. Father, I thank you for everything that the resurrection means. Father, I thank you, man, that because you rose. Father, I thank you, God, that we have power because you rose. Father, I thank you that we rise because you rose. Father, I thank you, God, that you gave us your son. And I pray, Lord, that we would choose to live a life that is submitted in obedience to him. It is in Christ, and we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to get ready to um, just kind of transition into um, communion. So if you need a communion cup, uh, just raise your hand, and the hospitality team will get you a communion cup. And as you're raising your hand and they're getting you those communion cups, um, we just want to extend the invitation. And that maybe there's somebody that, that is here today um, that is saying, hey, listen, my hope has been placed thing, my, my, my faith had been in the wrong thing, uh, Christ is right here in front of me, I've heard the gospel, but I keep turning away from it, I keep rejecting it, but you know, today I, I don't want to reject it no more, right, today I'm going to kind of give my right, let's give a, let's, let, let, let's, right? just in case there's somebody who wants to give their life to, to give that space and that time in that room, but maybe you here, and you just my life to Christ. I want to accept the gospel. I want to accept the hope that is him. And I just want you to hand in your seat um, and we'll acknowledge you in your seat. Hold on. All right, real quick. If you need communion cup, put your hand down. If you want to accept Christ, raise your hand. All right, amen. All right, bless you. Okay, now, if you need a communion cup, raise your hand. Amen. <laughs> um, I was getting confused for a second. Um, but after service, those hands that were raised, um, I just want you to come up here after service, and we're going to talk to you guys about um, the gospel and what that means, that next step for um, um, and, and, and confessing and putting your trust and faith. In. Um, but now as you guys your community, we're going to come up. From there, we're going to our offering time. Bear with us. Give me a couple more minutes today. We got a we got a baptism. Also, we got to do um, we have our baby dedications to do as well today. So, I'm just gonna go ahead and lead us in. Amen. Amen. Um, why is this hope important that our pastor is uh, sharing with us today? And the reason why we can't place our hope in other things of this world is because, honestly, it, it don't last. Like, they don't last. They temporary. They temporary fixes. They, they leave us feeling still empty, void. Amen. Um, and that's my testimony. Years ago, I gave my life to Jesus because uh, a man who abused me for years, he finally decided to leave me because I didn't have the courage to leave him. And... I was left without hope and knew that I needed Jesus. Um, and we serve a Savior who, can, who has given us reason to have eternal hope. This life is so temporal. Josh talked about it last week. Like, it's fading. Life is but a vapor. Like, it's here today and gone tomorrow. Like, people leave this earth, right? So don't place your hope in people like jobs finances they perish so don't place your hope 
and finances. Like, like drugs, like the high eventually leaves. So like, don't place your hope in that. Like the alcohol, like eventually you sober up. And, you, and then people, I, I talk to people who, who struggle with alcohol and it's like when they're withdrawing, right? When they drink every single day, when they're withdrawing, their body actually has a reaction to where they have to drink and now they, they need freedom. Like this freedom that we need, this freedom that we, that we deserve, honestly, right? That Jesus died for and we are unworthy, but he offered it for us. It's possible because of what he did for us. Um, this bread that we have, it represents uh, Christ's body that was broken for us so that we can be free, so that we can have an eternal hope. And so we take this bread and we eat together. Amen. And the cup, it just represents the shedding of Christ's blood. Without it, we couldn't have forgiveness for our sins. We couldn't, we couldn't have the imputed righteousness of God upon us without forgiveness, without the shedding of his blood, without being washed clean and set free. So, Lord, we thank you for the blood that was shed for us, and we drink together. Father, we thank you that we can place our eternal hope in you. And we pray that for those who are here who have not yet received you, that they may have been encouraged by this message, that they can move on to taking communion with the right heart and mind, knowing that they have received Christ as their Lord and Savior. We thank you for your sacrifice. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Oh, that's next. Amen. Okay. So the next thing that we have um, is our time of giving. Amen. Amen. Y'all, that's what's up. Y'all clapping for giving without prompting. That's dope. Um, <laughs> that means you see the value and the importance of it, right? Giving of our time, resources. But this is an opportunity for us to give with our with our financial resources, so we thank God for that. Um, there's a couple of ways to give in the Church Center app. Um, you also can scan this QR code if you do not have access to the Church Center app um, and give. So we'll pause and give you that opportunity. For those who would like to give in person, you should have an envelope at the, your chair. And hospitality will come and receive that from you. So I'll pause and then I'll pray. That you have shared your resources with us, that we may be able to uh, give them back to you, devote them back to you, that your kingdom may be advanced, oh God. Um, that you bless it beyond measure in Jesus' name. Amen. What's up, Reach? And all of our special guests, it's me, Coretta, and these are your announcements for this week. Join us this Wednesday morning at 6.30 for our morning prayer. This is a space where we intercede on behalf of our church family, community, and world. We'll be on Zoom. Pivot is back. Join the young adults for a pasta bar and Bible study on March 30th at 12 p.m. right here at the church. Come with a Bible, journal, and an empty stomach ready to go deeper. I'm going to need a plate. Ladies, if you join the church anywhere between November 2023 and March 2024, 
Join the Women in Leadership for a meet and greet on April 6th at 3 p.m. Men, there will be a prayer breakfast that same day at 9 a.m. So see Church Center or Rain or Josh for more information. Women, hey y'all, hey sis. Our annual women's retreat is coming up themed She Pursues, Seeking Him Through Your Five Senses. This will be August 30th through the 31st. More information coming soon. I heard, I ain't gonna say who told me though, but I heard April 2nd is Pastor Tank's birthday. Yep, yep. He going into the last year of his uh, 30s too, y'all. So, you know, let's be sure to show some love and give him some gifts, love on him, see him, his wife, or or one of us for details on how to, how to love on him, okay? Show our pastor some love. It's his birthday coming. Happy birthday. I'm going to tell you again, too. I'm going to tell you again. Fam, we need you involved. So as our church grows, so should our service. We encourage all members to be serving on the team. Please be thinking and praying on where you might serve and then sign up. These are your announcements for the week. Be sure to follow us on social media. And if you're a guest, we invite you to fill out a guest card at the hospitality table. Have a wonderful week. Amen, amen, amen. All right, so we got two more important things to do, and then we out of here. Y'all can go and who want to eat after this? Raise your hand if you want to eat after this. I'm about to say, do people do that anymore? I feel like that was like the old thing. Like, I don't feel like nobody going to eat after this. Who going to McDonald's to eat after this? <laughs> All right, well, we're going to, um, today we're going to be doing some baby dedications of three beautiful babies. Amen. Amen. And, and then after that, we're going to do our baptism. But listen, guys, real quick, as we get ready to do these baby dedications, I want you guys to give us your attention. Um, if I can have your attention, please, family. Thank you very much. Right? I want you guys to just be paying attention because when we do baby dedications, um, we do baby dedications and we talk about that baby dedications are not just something that the parents are doing for the kids. It's definitely not something that the kid is doing because the kid can't. Right? But it's also something that we join in as a church community. Right, saying that we also are going to surround these parents and support these parents as they live out the call on their life for their children, right? And so today we're going to be dedicating. Uh, we got. Yeah, I'm, I just give this real. We got Nobles the Fifth, right? Affectionately known here at Cinco. And with Cinco, we got the godparents and commit. And, yep. Oh, and B, oh, B. Oh, what up, B? <laughs> uh, and then we got Loria. Did I say that right? Look, I'm good. See, I'm getting all my pronunciations good today. We got Loria, right? I'm sorry, Cinco's. I'm sorry, Cinco's parents is no more Dasa. <laughs> then we got Loria, and her mother is LaQuinn. Let's go. Queen is a new member and just got baptized last week. Let's go. Right? And then we got young Isaiah and his parents is Kareem and Ashley Pope. And my wife is standing there because she's the guy. Mom, no? Okay. Because I, I, listen, I ain't even going to lie. I'm about to be in my head like, so that I didn't get this memo. Dad, I'm about to feel all types of way. <laughs> He's about to start a fight. <laughs> Right, but we got mom. What's up, mom? Right, and then we got Johnny. The guy, I don't know what I don't even know what I'm calling these people. And then I'm gonna get down the line, Johnny. <laughs> right, and then we got Ashley's mom and dad here with us as well. And so, and Danica, <laughs> and Tamika. <laughs> oh man, and so you know, I just want to say that when we talk about baby dedications, you guys. Um, here at Reach, obviously our belief is, is quite simple. Um, we don't believe that babies can make any 
dedication or commitment to the Lord in this infancy, right? And so this isn't a substitute for any level of baptism um, or anything of the such, right? These children are going to have to grow up, come to an age where they're going to make a decision for themselves to say that they want to walk with and follow the Lord. However, when we talk about a baby dedication, really it's a parent dedication, right? Really it's the parents saying two things, right? I want to be obedient to the call of God. And what is the call of God? Well, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 7, it reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk to, of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, right? And then it's that also that famous passage in Malachi, right? In Malachi, um, uh, when God talks about why did he bring two people together, right? In Malachi 2.15, <laughs> he says, and what did I expect from this union? He says, godly offspring, right? And so... And so these parents are coming together and they're saying, hey, we want to be obedient to the call of God. The call of God to say that we're going to raise our child in the ways of the Lord. The call of God that says we're going to be. <coughs> the elders about to get an on the spot training because they're going to have to finish this. <laughs> um, um, that we want to be obedient to the call of God to raise our children up in the way that they should go. And so each of these parents are coming here today and are present here today saying that we agree to that and we desire to do that. And so when they... When they make this commitment, this dedication, they do it in the presence of God and this church family, right? And so we are also saying that we are being committed to come inside of them and to support them in whatever it is that they need support in raising their children up in the ways of the Lord. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this presentation and I'm going to acknowledge that LaQuinn Lewis, my goodness, my boy, I think it's about to go away, uh, <coughs> that LaQuinn Lewis presents her daughter, Lariah, before God in this church. And I also acknowledge that Kareem and Ashley Pope present their son, Isaiah, before God in this church. And I also acknowledge that Nobles and Hadassah Darby present their son, Nobles V, or Cinco, before God in this church. And that they would do the best of their ability to raise their children up in the ways of the Lord. And by the way, commitments are real. God says, I'd rather you not make any oath than do one and not keep it. And so nobody is up here by force. Right, but they're making this commitment of willful of their own will, and God expects them to keep it. And so I'm gonna ask you guys a couple things, and you guys are gonna simply say we do if you agree. Amen. All right. Do you promise dependence upon God's grace and upon the partnership of this church to teach your child the truths of the Christian faith? Do you promise to set a Christian example before them in word and deed, remembering that your call to disciple is in your home. And lastly, do you promise to bring them up in the instructions and the disciplines of the Lord and to encourage them to accept Christ as their Savior under the guidance of the Holy Spirit? you as Lord, Savior, and grow to have a heart that is entire dedi entirely dedicated to the Lord. And so I'm going to pray. I normally would touch the babies and hold them, but I don't think I should. <laughs> but I'm just going to pray 
over the children. And so I got Raphael there. Babe, you can stand here uh, with Cinco. And um, um, jo uh, Josh is out there. All right, come real quick. Stand with uh, LaQuinn. Father, I just ask that you would substitute their hands for my hands, God, as they touch these beautiful we pray, Father, we thank you for these children. Lord, we know that children are a blessing from you. And so, Father, we thank you for the life of these children. We thank you for the love of their parents. First and foremost, that their parents have already took that step to say yes to you, to commit their life and surrender their life to you, which means, Lord, that these children have a better chance of knowing you and a better chance of accepting you and growing up in the ways of your word. And so, Father, I just pray now, Father. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would keep protect these children, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would bless these children, Father. I pray, God, that you would guard them for every fiery dart of the enemy. Father, I pray, we know that the, that the enemy loves to kill things in its infancy, so Lord, would you be a hedge of protection around these children, be a hedge of protection around the lessons that they learn from their parents, that he can't steal those lessons from them as they grow up, Father. Would you be a hedge of protection around these children, God, when the enemy tries to come for them? Lord, would you cover them? you pour your spirit out upon them when that time has come. Father, and would you choose, so choose to use them in a mighty way, in a way, Lord, you know the purpose for them. You saw them before we saw them. You saw them in their mother's womb. You knit them together in their mother's womb. Father, you have ordained every day of their life. And so, Father, I pray that by your mighty hand, there could be no plan that is thwarted on their life by the enemy. By your strength, you keep them. By their strength, you guard them. By your strength, God, they become and do everything that you have called them and created them to do. And Father, would you give the parents the strength to endure? The strength to endure a culture, God, that is drastically running away from you. And these children have to be raised up in this culture. Lord, so would you give the parents the strength to endure in your word as they teach their children? Would you give the parents the strength to be separate from this world as they raise their children? Would you give the parents the strength and the trust, rather, Lord? Give them the trust to trust you with these children's lives, knowing that it's scary. And these children are going to grow up one day and, and, and hearts are going to grow weary and, and be anxious as this world is just wicked and wicked. But, Lord, would you help these parents to trust you with the life that is their child, remembering, God, that they are yours first and that they are here only to steward the life in which you have given them on this earth. And so, Father, bless the parents. Give them wisdom. Give them strength. Help them to endure in raising their children up in the ways that they should go bless these children, God, that they would grow up to know you. It is in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give it up for our baby. We got one thing, y'all, and we out. Baptisms! I gotta stop. Maybe I should stop yelling. Whoever brought this up here is a lifesaver. This hit, this hit right there. That honey it fixed all that. Ooh, that was rough. I'm scared. Huh. Thought that was it. I'm like, not on Resurrection Sunday, Lord. <laughs> so it was a beautiful thing that took place. Last Sunday, after all of you all left, um, I was in my office, um, and some other people were somewhere around here, um, and I came out of my office, and I'm seeing Coretta sitting over there with Anaya, and I'm like, why is she crying? I'm like, what's wrong with the baby? <laughs> and uh, Coretta comes, and she gathers everybody, and she says, hey, we got an announcement to make. She had been sitting there talking to Anaya about the gospel and Christ. I'm saying that right, right? Okay. The gospel. And right there in the cafe area, right, after hours, right, she confessed faith in Christ and said, listen, I want to be saved. And it was such a beautiful thing, right? So shout out to Coretta. 
for always being what Coretta going to do, y'all. Now, y'all know Coretta. Coretta going to give you that gospel one way or another. She going to pull up on you. And so shout out to Coretta for, for that time that she took after service uh, to just speak with Anaya. Shout out to Myrna uh, as our children's and youth director who continues to just pour truth into our children always, making sure that they're not just playing games in children's church, but they're actually learning the gospel. Amen? Amen. And so because of that confession, y'all know me. You getting baptized, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, Coretta and them talked, and Myrna talked with her, and she said, yeah, I, want, I want to get baptized today. And so, you know, mom is here, right? And grandma, grandma, hey, grandma. And, and dad is here, right? And then y'all know her brother, you know what I'm saying? AD is here. Oh, yeah, uncle. That's his uncle. That's her uncle. <laughs> and so AD going to come up here, and he going to help me with the baptism um can you take that off please we tried to make it warm we'll see i tried but just for you um here at reach you know when we teach about baptism man we believe that baptism uh is both an outward expression of an inward action but it's also a declaration into the the kingdom of darkness that you are no longer belonging to the kingdom of darkness that going into the water is representation of going into the grave and coming out of the water is a representation of being resurrected with Jesus Christ. But when you go into the grave there's a declaration that is being made to the kingdom of darkness right that I am down here but when I rise up right it declares to him that he has no more power over you it declares to him that you are now free from all sin and death right that you are no longer in chains the blindfolds have been removed supernaturally by Jesus Christ and so that declaration takes place when we go into the water and we come out and so it is a public declaration that you all now are she's saying I identify with Christ but then also she is waging war you hear me say that every week she is waging war against the kingdom of darkness saying I am no longer a child of yours I no longer belong to you but I am free and I belong to Christ and so as she comes to get back to me and so uh, as she comes forward to get baptized and I am going to have you come Be a resurrection, Father, um, and what that means, Father, and specifically right now, what that means for my niece and I right now, Father. Um, thank you um, for just loving her, Father, and giving her the opportunity, Father, to be in a relationship with you, Father. Um, in this moment, Father, as she declares, Father, her her position, Father, will her trust in you with her life, Father. We pray that you continue to, to guide her, Father. Uh, this isn't just a moment, Father, but she's rather living her life out now, Father, um, in allegiance with you, Father. Following you, Father. So I just pray over protection of her life, Father. When the enemy tries to come, Father, and mess with her, Father, and get her off, get her off course, Father. That she remembers who her Lord and Savior is, Father, and that she can endure, Father, because of your Holy Spirit, Father. So we thank you for that. Pray the CNA. Amen. you three questions. Okay. Is it? Is it? Oh, okay. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you five questions. Oh. <laughs> Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior? Do you believe that he died on the cross? Do you believe that he was buried? And do you believe that he rose and ascended into the right hand of the Father? And are you ready to make him Lord of your life? Well, my sister, 
It is upon the confession of your faith that it is my honor and my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Water ain't that cold today. Anybody else? Son, oh Lord, I gotta teach him. <laughs> well, listen, let's give it up again for our sister Anaya. Make sure y'all hug her, make sure y'all love on her, make sure y'all be ready to support her new journey, amen? Right, and we come around one another and help disciple, and so I know she's gonna be all right because she got y'all, amen. And Jesus, all right. Well, listen, guys, I appreciate you guys hanging out with us a little bit longer today. Uh, thank you guys for, um, yeah, just being here today. Thank you guys for looking good. Uh, I was just gonna say, y'all look good next week, fellas. Y'all know what it is, amen. So, listen, man, we're gonna stand to receive the benediction. If you're a visitor, my wife and I will be standing up here. We would love just to shake your hand and say hello to you. I'm going to wash them, but we're going to love to just shake your hand and say hello to you. Uh, also, if you raise your hand during the time of saying that you wanted to accept Christ, uh, please come up here. Uh, we'll be here to talk to you guys uh, about the gospel. And lastly, maybe you've been here, maybe you first time here, uh, but you say, listen, man, I'm, I'm looking for a church home, and I'm interested in making this my church home. You can also come up here, uh, and we'll help you understand, like, get you started on how to start that process of uh, beginning the process of, of joining at Reach. Amen? Amen. So let us uh, receive the benediction. Yeah. Hey, T, real quick, can you stay up here? So, um, real quick, I just wanted to take some time to just um, pray for our pastor and his family. Um, this week, they experienced the loss of his cousin, who was a dear love brother of many, cousin of many, nephew of others. Um, we know his mom is here today as well. So, Pastor, you always taking time to consider us and the things that we experience in life. And we just thank you so much for still coming to serve today, serving your daughter over the weekend, being with your family, just all of those things. Um, and I know you're tired and you probably, you know, been trying to pour out to your own family this week. And we just thank you for coming to pour into us. So I just want to pray that you be strengthened through the rest of this week and the days ahead as y'all prepare to, you know, um, memorialize your your, your cousin, okay? Amen. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you um, for the pastor and shepherd of this house, God. Thank you for his life. Thank you for um, his, uh, his sacrifice, his continued sacrifice and devotion, not to us, but to you. Everything he does for us is because he loves you, God, and he continues to say yes to you no matter what, Father. And so we just, we just pray that you may strengthen him this week and the days ahead, Father God, as he figures out just the process of serving his own family, um, being, being served as well. I pray that he may be vulnerable enough to show us how we can come alongside of him, um, to love on him in Jesus' name. Uh, we pray for his family as well, God, that you may comfort the hearts of those who are grieving. We pray that even they may have been encouraged by the message today, Father, that all of hope is in you, God. When we are experiencing loss, when we are experiencing um, sorrow, Lord, that joy comes in the morning. Thank you for that. We thank you again, God, for just the way that you love on us through our pastor, God. Um, and we just pray that you continue to keep him, keep his mind, keep his heart, keep his body. And Lord, we pray that he just continues to remember that vengeance um, Lord, and that you bring um, his cousin's uh, life to justice in Jesus. Amen. And so, Lord, we just thank you for bringing us together today. Um, we pray that we together continue to celebrate. May everybody just enjoy the time that they may be spending, spending with their families and observing of, of your resurrection. Thank you, and we love you in Jesus' name. Go with God. Amen. <laughs>